Welcome back. It could be a while before the Democrats know who their nominee for president will be. More waves for the current president after a shakeup in the Department of Justice and the budget submitted from the Trump administration is sure to bring another partisan fight. We'll get to all of that in these topics this morning with former Rock Island Mayor Mark Schwiebert, a Democrat and Rock Island County Republican Party Chair Drew Milkey. Great to see you guys. Welcome. Good to be here. Thank you. Let's start with the budget. The Trump administration submitted about a $4.8 trillion spending plan to the Congress. It proposes spending increases for the Homeland Security by 3%, a 12% increase for NASA with goals of going back to the moon. Veterans Affairs sees a 13% hike and a slight increase for the Pentagon. Critics on the left point to cuts to safety net programs like Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program. It cuts EPA spending by more than 26%, Health and Human Services by 9%. Key components there are the National Institutes of Health and the CDC at a time when controlling the coronavirus is a priority these days. And an 8% cut for the Department of Education. President Donald Trump proposed to a promise to eliminate the government's debt by the time he leaves office in 2025, grown by $3 trillion actually under his watch so far. The Washington Post reports the budget would add another $5 trillion over the next decade. The Republicans in Congress have shied away from a lot of the spending cuts proposed so far. I guess what is the impact of cuts to Medicaid, the Children's Insurance, the EPA, and the rest versus the increases to Homeland Security and NASA, for example? Mark? Well, I think that it's another indication of how Donald Trump is really out of touch with a lot of things that the public cares about. One of the things that's being proposed in this budget are cuts in Medicare as well as in Medicaid. That's something he promised he wouldn't pursue. There are cuts in the USDA budget, which is the Department of Agriculture. I mean, I think there's already been enough damage done with the tariffs that were imposed as a result of the trade war he started. Uh, and then, of course, uh, what's been done with regard to ethanol and the undercutting of that by releasing of waivers. So farmers have already been pretty hard hit. This is going to hit them harder. I guess the overarching thing is that it's going to be another trillion dollar deficit from, from a party that historically has stood for balanced budgets, and I'm not sure exactly how that squares. I'm sure Drew will have some insights in that, but I, I think it, it really is a departure from what the Republican <coughs> Party has historically stood for, and in this case, really hurts the, the middle class and the working folks even more. Drew, fiscal conservatism seems to be called into question here. Well, I think we're seeing uh, this budget is based on uh, the greatest, uh, I guess, economic engine we've seen in the last 50 years. And so these are optimistic uh, economic projections, but they're very doable. And we've seen what the effects of the Trump administration and the policies have done for an economic. So this is based on economic projections are optimistic, but doable. Um, you know, uh, the, other, the other component of this is we've seen um, targeting uh, redundancies and bureaucracy at the federal level that can be cut. And so that, that, that's the other target for the Trump administration. Well, we also, well, uh, we'll get to another topic in a second, but the economic engine argument actually, the, like I think the domestic GDP grew by like 2.6% last year, and, and we've seen much bigger growth in the past. So that being, the argument being the greatest economic engine in history is, is a Republican talking history. point, but not necessarily not based history. historically. But, but, we've, we've seen, but yeah. people, are, people are working now and uh, we, we've, seen, we've seen impressive unemployment numbers. And let's move on. There was major upheaval in the Department of Justice this week uh, surrounding the federal prosecution of Donald Trump ally Roger Stone. Stone's awaiting sentencing for obstruction, lying to Congress, and witness tampering. Prosecutors recommended a tough seven to nine year sentence. A reversal, though, from the DOJ this week asked for a much lighter punishment. Four prosecutors who have been working closely on that case withdrew from it. One of them quit DOJ altogether. And then a fifth prosecutor on tap for a promotion, a big one, to the Treasury Department, resigned from the administration after the president removed her nomination. This is the same branch of DOA the Michael Flynn prosecution is being handling in this sentencing as well. The Department of Justice is supposed to be independent of the president's influence. This does raise some concerns that the opposite is happening. Attorney General William Barr says the president didn't interfere, but criticized the president for his activity on Twitter. Uh, all this comes after the president fired two of the witnesses in the impeachment investigation. The president is allowed to fire people, but why is any of this a problem, or is it, Drew? Well, the seven to nine year sentence that was proposed, which, by the way, as you said, Attorney General Barr, already prior to President Trump speaking out on it, was going to reduce it. it that, was, that was a horrible, uh, that's like a death sentence for uh, possibly for that gentleman. Uh, so th the thing is that President Trump did vocalize his opinion through tweets. Ten, uh, we have to believe Attorney General Barr wasn't uh, persuaded by it. And the fact remains is that the, the, the president can pardon this sentence anyhow. So what is the end game for him to, he's not influencing at all because he has influence at the end if he wants. So there's no point in trying to influence. So I, I, I agree that it's not an influence game. Um, I think the president probably shouldn't tweet. 
uh, on this matter right now, but, but there's no conspiracy where he's trying to influence. Do you think, uh, you all, all bored with that, Mark, or you take, have a different take? Well, I don't think he would be tweeting if he didn't think it influenced, and I think his response when uh, uh, Attorney General Barr criticized him for doing so reflected that fact. He talked about how he could tweet and do what he wanted, and he had the right to influence if he wanted to, and I think that's just another illustration of what we have, which is kind of a president that's out of control. He's interfered with the Justice Department and the Administration of Justice, which uh, Attorney General Barr himself said today makes doing his job with integrity impossible. Uh, he's interfered with discipline in the military uh, where people were um, committing acts of torture and were being disciplined by their superior officers and he interfered in that process. This guy has a very low bar when it comes to uh, behavior. Uh, he uh, tolerates a great deal from people who are supportive of him and comes down very hard on anybody who opposes him and that's a little frightening because that's usually the behavior of a demagogue. All right, let's move on to one last topic before we go. It's not March Madness, but we are down to the Elite Eight, if you will. These are the Democrats still in the race for president after the New Hampshire primary prompted Andrew Yang, Michael Bennett, and Deval Patrick to end their campaigns. The faces here are vying for the all-important delegates to win their party's nomination. Here's the delegate count as it stands now after Iowa and New Hampshire. It takes 1,991 delegates to win on the first ballot. Only 65 delegates awarded of the almost 4,000 up for grabs so far. Pete Buttigieg, 23. Bernie Sanders, 21. They lead the pack, followed by Elizabeth Warren with eight. Amy Klobuchar, seven. Uh, Joe Biden, six. Nevada goes next, then South Carolina. And they're followed by 14 states on Super Tuesday with more than 1,300 delegates being allocated then. I guess, Mark, this is more of a Democratic question. If we have time, we'll get Drew in. But let's, how much clearer do you think the race will be by then? What well, credence do you give the talk that there's a real chance for a brokered convention this year? Is this good for whoever becomes the nominee? It's going to be a really interesting year. I think there are a couple of things worth noting. First of all, the two states that have voted and are good neighbors to the north are one of them, uh, as we're sitting here in Rock Island, uh, and the other one's New Hampshire. They're not exactly a cross-section of America. So what we've seen so far isn't necessarily reflective of what's going to shake out. I also think it's interesting that the moderate candidates, those who've identified themselves with a more moderate position, in New Hampshire and in Iowa both came out on top, if you put them together. Uh, it, it's interesting that a young person, uh, Pete Buttigieg, is, is doing as strongly as he has as a former mayor. I can't uh, say enough about the qualifications <laughs> of being a mayor for high or office. So, wait, is there a 2024 <laughs> campaign in the but, but I will say that I think that there are a couple of wild cards in the deck. One of them is that we just aren't far enough along to make any predictions. And there are a number of candidates that have all demonstrated viability. The other thing that's going to be a... Good for the uh, nominee, whoever it is after. Uh, well, I think so, because I think there is a, has been a very unanimous concern census that we need to be defeat Donald Trump for the reasons we've already talked about in this program. But the other thing that I think is interesting that we haven't seen before is we've got two billionaires in the race. And what the factor of that's going to be on the outcome of this election I think is going to be real interesting as well. I'm not real excited about people who qualify by virtue of their wealth. But it can't be underestimated that the money they can bring to a campaign is going to be influential. Thanks, so Matt. Got out of time. Sorry, Drew. I can't even squeeze you in on this one. Well, Drew, Mark, thanks so much that. for the conversation. <laughs> It'll be interesting for sure. And there's always something to talk about.